Hi, everyone, and welcome to The Women's Game. I'm Sam Mewis, and today we have an incredible interview with Bethany Balser, a.k.a. Boats, Seattle ran forward, and overall wonderful human being. Bethany and I got to speak about her unique path to the NWSL via an NAIA school as opposed to an NCAA school. We also spoke about her triumphs as a pro and her challenges, including her relationship with anxiety and mental health. Before we get to Bethany, the U.S. moves on to play Brazil on Sunday in the W Gold Cup final at 8.15 p.m. Eastern on Paramount+. Plus. I'm actually heading to San Diego to be at that game, so I'm hoping to see some of you there. Across the pond, Kat Macario returned for Chelsea this past weekend after 641 days of being injured. And in true Kat Macario fashion, she scored a goal within six minutes of being subbed on the field. All Americans, all Chelsea fans can rejoice at this news. I am so thrilled for Kat. I feel like I kind of understand the pains of being injured for a long time. And I feel really, really joyful for her that she is back doing what she loves after such a difficult period of so much adversity. I'm thrilled to see Kat back out there. Really happy to see her as she continues her rise to becoming one of the best players in the world. The FA Cup quarterfinals are going on this weekend in England. So make sure you check out our socials for information on how to follow those games on Saturday and Sunday mornings. I wanted to share this email from Sarah Groats. She said, I transitioned from soccer to cross country and track at the age of 12, which seemed like the biggest decision of my life at the time, LOL. I ran through college and now have started doing marathons and will be running Boston this April. I always save the women's game for my long runs each week. I would love any recommendations for the Boston area. Sarah, God bless you for running the Boston Marathon. That is so cool. I would love to watch you do that. My recommendations for coffee are Madhouse Cafe. My recommendation for a wine shop, maybe you can pick up a bottle of wine at Neighborhood Wines in the South End after the marathon. And then my recommendations for dinner are Source Restaurant in Cambridge, you have to get the pepperoni pizza, Gray's Hall in Southie, and Comfort Kitchen in Dorchester. Good luck with the marathon, Sarah. That's only a few weeks away. And please give your dog, Blueberry, a big kiss from me. For all of you listening, Sarah did include a picture of her dog in her email, and I'm not saying that she got preferential treatment and that that's why I chose to read her email, but it certainly didn't hurt. So please send more dog pictures. If you want any recommendations or if you have questions for me, email me. Our email is womensgamemib at menandblazers.com. And without further ado, here is Bethany Balser. Bethany is a forward for the Seattle Reign, and she came into the NWSL from Spring Arbor University, which is an NAIA school in Michigan, a path to the pros that's not really typical for NWSL players. NAIA is a college athletics governing body that's for smaller programs typically than you'd find in NCAA. But Bethany is entering her sixth season in the NWSL, and she entered the NWSL undrafted in 2019, only to win Rookie of the Year that same year, which I think is like the coolest story ever to happen in the NWSL. It's <laughs> so crazy and awesome. Um, and I'm so looking forward to spending time with Bethany's day. I really admire the journey that she's been on and the tenacity that she's shown in fighting her way to the top. And also because she just has so many layers to her game, I'm blown away by her fearlessness to speak her mind. She's known for her honesty and willingness to engage on social media. Her pages include some hilariously personal themes like her Detroit Lions fandom and her ever present plane delays. And then some big and brave themes like mental health awareness and how it affects her own life. I can't wait to talk about all of it. Probably won't be mentioning the Lions, but that's okay. Bethany, welcome to the women's game. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. You did your research. <laughs> I really did. I really did my research. And I've also heard, we've never been on the same team, but I heard from Allie Long years ago that you had a nickname <laughs> on Seattle that was, I know everybody calls you Boats now, but Allie Long used to call you Betty B. And so when I was researching and like thinking about this interview, I kept going, oh, I have to do the Betty B stuff. I have to do the Betty B stuff. <laughs> so I'm wondering if you can share us a story about either nickname, Betty B or Boats. Yeah, I had I have so many and they just kind of evolve. Um, well, Allie Long is also the one who coined Boats. So I'm surprised she didn't mention that. Um, but that was because I, I have like bigger feet for my height. So it partially has to do with that, but it also has to do with the fact that I just wore like a size, size and a half too big of shoes. 
because I just liked the space. I like to cross my toes sometimes, which is so weird. And so there was one day, she's like, you look like you have clown feet, like you have boats. And then it just kind of stuck and it's evolved to boatsy, boatsy boats, Betty boats. Like it's just everywhere now. <laughs> I love it. Well, I feel like too formal calling you Bethany. So should I call you Betty or boats or is this too presumptuous of me? No, not presumptuous at all. I honestly, boats is what like everyone now calls me. And so they'd be like talking about actual boats and I'm like turning like what? And so <laughs> that works fine. I love that. Okay. Boats. Here we are. Um, you're about like so much more than soccer. So my question is, how would you describe yourself if you couldn't talk about soccer at all? Wow. I've never been asked that before. Um, yeah, I think I just have so many other interests than soccer and so soccer's just never fully consumed my life um and in high school people know like I've diversified myself I play basketball I love basketball I was in musicals um and yeah and like now I have this passion for mental health and so I'm pursuing my uh, master's in counseling and so I just feel like yeah so I don't know I just feel like I'm someone that wants to use platforms um, to speak about things that maybe aren't spoken about. And one of those is mental health. And so, yeah, I just think there's so much more to life than soccer and soccer is just a really cool way to use a platform, I think. Totally. I love that answer. I was going to add some things about myself that have nothing to do with soccer. I'm a jog mom. I love eating. Mm -hmm. I yeah. recently am obsessed with Yorkshire pudding. Have you ever had that? Oh, I have not. It's like part of like a, what you'd get at like a Sunday roast at like an English pub. And my husband oh. homemade it the other day and it's so good. It's kind of like bread. Um, nice. And then I'm also very type A, which has nothing to do with soccer, but it's a huge part of my personality. <laughs> Same. <laughs> do you agree? Okay. Yeah. Good to know. Um, okay. So you grew up in Hudsonville, Michigan. Mm -hmm. Big year to be a Michigan sports fan with the Lions and the University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. Football doing really well. I'm a state fan, so. <laughs> oh, never mind. Never it's mind. Okay. okay. Um, so you stayed in state in Michigan um, and you went to Spring Arbor University. But can you tell us something that we haven't mentioned yet that you love about Michigan? Um, I like Lake Michigan, the beaches. If you go up, Michigan's so underrated. Like we have what the largest non saltwater lakes in the world. Um, so it's just so beautiful. So I live like 20 minutes from Lake Michigan. The beaches are great. There's actually sand. Unlike here in Washington, they're all rock beaches. <laughs> so I definitely miss that when I'm here. Um, do you like boat or do you swim or do you kayak? What do you like to do on the water? Um, just going in it and swimming, honestly. Yeah, love that. Um, I used to like go water skiing and my body cannot take tubing anymore. <laughs> I hear you yep. on that. Tubing is, is so fun though. I used to tube as a kid and I remember yeah. just like laughing the whole time as you'd like bump along. <laughs> yeah. And now whenever they did like donuts, I'm like, no, I'm out. I gotta leave. No, we're, we're sadly getting too old for that. Um, <laughs> okay. So you grew up with four siblings. Did all your brothers and sisters play soccer as well? Yep. We all played club at the same time, all played in high school. And then my sister and younger brother, and I, we all played in college. Amazing. Um, would you guys all like play together in the yard? Um, no, we weren't the closest of siblings. We actually would play everything but soccer, I think. Probably because when we were okay. at home, we're like, we can, you know, make up all of our own games. Um, but yeah, maybe we would usually play like at our sibling soccer games because we were always yeah. being dragged to each other's yeah. events. Yeah, I know. That's a lot being one of five kids. That's a, a big family. Um, so you went to Unity Christian High School and you mentioned already that you played basketball. Did you play basketball all through high school? What was that like? Yeah, I played all four years and I loved it. There's actually a moment my junior year, I was already committed to Spring Arbor for soccer. And I was like, wait, I love basketball. Like, am I making the right decision? Because I just had so much fun. Like, it was such a good experience. Uh, had a really good team and I was like maybe basketball be a better option but obviously stuck with soccer but I like love basketball so much can you tell us what you took from your basketball career into soccer do you feel like any skills or any lessons you learned overlapped yeah 
and my coaches told me that it did too. I think one thing is just like vision on, on the court, on the field. Like I was a point guard, so I had to have good vision. I was like team passer because I couldn't shoot to save my life. Um, and so I think that was something that really helped me. But in terms of like, uh, like fitness wise, they're two completely different sports. Like basketball is so much shorter. So I just think mostly like field vision was probably the most beneficial in crossover. Yeah. You mentioned already that um, you had committed to Spring Arbor when you were a junior. And I think this is where like your story starts to get so interesting is I want to know what your recruiting process was like when you were in high school. I feel like a lot of NWSL players probably have the same story about, I don't know, getting recruited to a few like D1 schools and then going on visits and deciding to go there. Um, that's very much what happened to me. It's kind of like the cookie cutter response, but I want to hear what it was like for you. Were you considering going to any NCAA schools? Was professional soccer on your radar? Can you just tell us a little bit about the recruiting process for you in high school? Yeah. So I got injured with a knee injury that took me out most of my sophomore year, which is kind of when the recruiting process starts. So a lot of those potentially bigger schools that we have a local D2 school, that's pretty good. Like their coach didn't care because like I was injured. And so that like sophomore year is when you start visiting and start making those decisions. And so by the time my junior year came around, um, I was just, my sister went to Spring Arbor too. So I was just always on their campus, always like around that. And so um, it was obvious that I was gonna visit there. Um, and then I visited like another NAI school in that conference and that was it. I didn't go on any other visits. Um, pro soccer was not on my mind. I just wanted to play college soccer. I didn't even think of it as a, I mean, it's always like a dream, but like you never think of it becoming an actual reality. And I had no idea if I was good enough. Um, and so, yeah, that was all I did. So it's definitely not the most traditional story by any means, but um, it was kind of just what fell right in my lap and I just took it. I was like, this will work, this is gonna be great. How far is Spring Arbor from your family's house? Like two hours. So it was oh. close, but far enough away where I felt like I was getting out of town. Yeah, and did you play with your sister there? Yeah, my freshman year, she was a senior and we played together. Did you guys win that year? We won the national championship that oh, year. Oh, that's so yeah. cool. Do you guys yeah. still talk about that now? Oh yeah, we definitely do. We won a state title in high school together and we hated each other then. And then by the time we were both in college, we had like loved each other. Um, and it's actually funny. We always like talk about you and Christy, like just playing together as sisters. It's like the absolute funnest thing. I was just going to say me and Christy did not get along in high school either. <laughs> and it was like the longest we ever got to play together. So I wish that we had been better friends mm -hmm. because we've, we've gotten to play with each other a little bit since, but it was such a different like environment than high school was. And yeah. we really weren't friends until like I was out of college. That's when mm. we like, started liking each other, which is so wild. <laughs> yeah, I can really. <laughs> um, okay, so speaking of Spring Arbor, you won a title your freshman year and then you won another title. And over your whole career there, you scored 129 goals in 98 games over four years. That's like literally over 40 <laughs> goals a season, which is I don't know if people don't know this, but that's crazy. Um, and you just got inducted into the SAU Athletic Hall of Fame in January. So congratulations for that. But Thanks. what was playing soccer like for you in college? Like, did it feel challenging or were you just scoring goals like whenever you wanted? Yeah, I think my freshman year, my sister prepared me. She's like, this isn't going to be a walk in the park. Like, you got to work. You got to do every fitness test that they send over the summer. Like, she scared me almost. I was like, okay, like I'm going to do it all. Um, and I, I, my freshman year is kind of a blur. Like I don't really remember a lot of it. I just remember that I played really well. And I think like my na naivety, my naiveness, oh, yeah. I don't know the word, yeah. like just kind of played towards my advantage. Um, but no, I definitely felt challenged all four years, which is why I stayed because after my freshman and sophomore year, I did have the opportunity to transfer to like big 10 schools. Um, but I just felt home at Spring Arbor and there were players that were there that I knew could push me. Um, and that's what ended up happening. And I felt like each year, um, I progressively grew in my game. Um, so obviously I'm really happy I stayed there, but there were opportunities to leave. And I did have those thoughts, like, am I going to grow here? Like I just 
feel like I peaked freshman year, but like, no, there was still room to grow and there were people around me who could help me get there. Yeah. So while you were there and I saw this on your Twitter, um, when you guys would travel for nationals, your team would stay four to a room and you'd have a bed buddy Mm -hmm. on your Twitter. You made a joke that this would put D1 athletes into a coma. And I literally (laughs) was reading it going like this, which like, it was really surprising and crazy, but also cool that you shared it. Also that your pregame meals would be a pit stop at Walmart on the way to the game to pick up Uncrustables and Cheez-Its, which honestly could be worse. (laughs) But how do you think about these experiences now? Like knowing the preparation that you do with Seattle in a, at the professional level, like how did you adjust from these kinds of preparation to your professional career? It, it, I'm still adjusting. I feel like I think (laughs) my rookie year, I was just like, wow, everything's so nice, which it was, but like, there's obviously a standard we have to meet. And I think every year I'm like realizing more and more what that standard looks like. Um, I'm very glad I came from like such humble beginnings and like, didn't have a lot because it makes me really grateful for what we have now. Um, And yeah, I think part of it is just like the investment into women's sports in general, like, um, like Spring Arbor just didn't have money and they did what they could with what they had. Um, And so I'm just hoping that like, as the professional level begins to grow, like everything underneath it will also grow. Yeah. And, and again, I know that you, um, posted about this stuff because you raised money to send back to your college program, mm-hmm. which I thought was amazing. And I was wondering if you wanted to tell us a little bit about that. I know you love SAU, so I wanted to <laughs> let, have you share why it's so important for you to um, yeah. raise money for the program. Yeah, so actually my sister's the head coach there now. And so she just reached out and asked if I would um, do like a cleat auction to help raise yeah. funds for the program. Um, usually we do... Like uh, in the summer, we do a we go to the Michigan International Speedway and we work from like 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. to fundraise. We work in like these tents and serve food to the people going to watch the race. The race. Cars. Oh my gosh! And so like we did like everything we could to raise money. We'd go door to door asking for pop cans to return. And so um, yeah, I think she was just looking for a way to like help out even more. And so uh, yeah, I was able to do a cleat auction and sell like five or six of my cleats and raise over $3,000 to give to them. So wow. yeah, that was really cool. That's so cool. Well, that's awesome. Um, all right. I want to transition now into again, like such an interesting time period where you're at an NAIA school in Michigan and you find yourself trying out for the NWSL in Seattle. What did you start thinking about this during your senior year? Did you have start to have your sights set on the NWSL or like what happened to get you from Michigan to Seattle? Yeah, so I played summer league for the Sounders women the summer before. And that was kind of my first test. Like I was playing with girls in the Pac-12 and that was kind of the summer where I was like gauging where I was at what I could do if being pro was possible. And it ended up going really well. I think we, again, like won the summer nationals there, which was awesome. And um, that kind of got my foot in the door in terms of Seattle, because the coaches just knew each other. Um, but at the time, Vlaco was the coach at the rain and he knew an NAIA coach from Kansas, like where he's from. So I just had these little crazy connections and was able to get an invite that way. Um, but going into my senior year, I definitely started to think like, okay, like we'll pursue this and see what comes of it. If it doesn't work, maybe that's a sign, but I want to try and just see. Yeah. So we're talking about Vlaco Andonofsky, the former U S women's national team head coach and the current Kansas city, current head coach. Did he ever call you and say, come to Seattle? Like, how did you literally decide (laughs) to fly to Seattle? Yeah. So he had told my college coach at the time that I was getting invited, but then he made like the personal call to me and was like, Oh, cool. This is going to be like very, very challenging. Um, but yeah, he was able to personally call me, but before I actually went, I went and tried out for Chicago, which I don't think a lot of people know. I went to like an open tryout for them and got invited into their camp. Um, but I, I kind of just said, no, I want to go to Seattle just because I had more connections there. So ended up obviously working out, but yeah, that's kind of yeah. Do you remember like what you were feeling during this time? Like you're showing up to preseason. I don't know if you knew anybody, but were you nervous? Were you trying to like be chill about it? Like what were your emotions showing up to preseason? I was, I was so scared 
Um, thankfully, like the summer before, playing with like other Division One girls made me feel like a little bit better. Um, but I was like, this is a whole new mountain. Um, I will, my, my first few training sessions, I was like, this is crazy. Like, I have to run all the time. I just feel like I'm doing doggies back and forth, sprinting. Um, and like just the pace of play was so much faster than I thought it would be. And so it's one of those things I always tell people like you either when you get thrown into that environment, you either like adjust and figure it out or like you just can't keep up. And so in my head, I was like, Beth, just like keep up, just keep going, like do whatever you can. And so it was definitely like so overwhelming. And then the fact that like I'm in the room with at the time, like Megan Rapino, Ali Long, I was like, I, I literally remember like just quickly snapping a photo. Like I was in such fangirl mode, but I'm like, I got to focus. So yeah. That is so funny. And then was there like a specific moment you remembered? Like, did Vlaco call you and say you made the team? Like, was there a specific moment where you made it? Yeah, there. They were already in Houston for the first game of the season, and he called me and said, "We want to like give you a contract." Um, and they flew me down like four hours later to Houston, and then I ended up playing in the game that weekend. So I was expecting to just be a um, national team replacement player because there was a World Cup uh -huh. that summer. It was 2019. Um, which I was like obviously happy with. I'm like if I can stay here and train and do that But then apparently the whole time they were working on like opening up a roster spot and then it opened up and I Three hours later. I'm on a plane. So how did that? How did that feel? Um, Crazy he was like he was texting he texted me because he was on the flight and he was like <laughs> Do you want to sign like a full rock like a, a full team spot? And I was like, uh, yeah, and he's like, okay, like <laughs> Let me get the owner and he'll send everything over. So then like I called my mom, well, I called my sister first, obviously, called my yeah. mom and dad. Like it was such a whirlwind. And then I had to like I had to sign a contract, went over to the neighbors, printed off the paper and <laughs> signed it and was off. I think it's so cool. So this is your rookie year. You played in 25 games, you scored six goals, and I like remember hearing about you that year. You were undrafted, but you like were the buzz of the league. Like not only because you didn't take this traditional path, but because you made such a strong impact out of any other rookie. And I would watch you like scoring header goals on replay after every weekend. You were just making like such a notable mark on the league. You were so good around the goal. And then you won rookie of the year, which again, just for everybody, if you don't know, as an undrafted player is, is so amazing. So what do you think it is about your game that is so effective at scoring goals in the league? you've called yourself unorthodox and what what does that mean to you yeah i just think i'm like <laughs> it's sometimes when i say i'm unorthodox it's like a shot at myself because like i just feel like sometimes i'm so gangly and i'm my friend my teammates call me like organized chaos like they're like i don't know how you just did that but like it looked so unathletic but somehow you did it and i don't know i just feel like that's been something that even i've like carried through college like I, I obviously had a lot of experience scoring goals in college, which I think helped play to my advantage. Um, and it, I, I, I don't know. People just say I have a knack for goal, and I guess I just do. I love being in the box. I love getting my head on crosses. Um, and so, yeah, I don't really know how to explain it. I guess it's just the gift I've been given, but um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think you also almost have like a fearlessness, like – you'll take a risk to put your head on something that maybe somebody else wouldn't and they just go in and it's so awesome to see. I, <laughs> I like love watching you play. Um, you're back with the rain this season after coming off a really incredible season, you guys lost in the final, but you did awesome, but you're without some really notable players this year, Megan Rapinoe who retired Rose Lavelle and Emily Sonnet who moved to Gotham as free agents in the off season. So sixth year in the league, how do you see your role changing as you you become a veteran now? It's so weird to hear you say, first of all. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like each year I've been here, it's evolved. Like, I I know that I'm I'm the third longest, like, tenured player with the rain. Like, Jess and Lou are the other two. And it's, it's just, crazy. like, yeah, it's crazy to think about. And I think, like, each year my leadership has just – I've tried to, like, step into it more and grow into it more. Um, and – it's definitely something that's way more prominent this year just with Pino being gone because she was like such a huge leader because um, she was with the rain for her entirety of the career. And so, um, yeah, it's definitely exciting and fun. Um, I'm learning a lot and we have a lot of young players this year. So it's like just managing them and helping them get adjusted and acclimated. Um, 
I'm just trying to take like what I learned from the people that did it for me and like apply it to them because the people I had were so great. Um, so yeah, just like injecting confidence into these new players and just continuing the culture that we have at the ring. Yeah, I think that the, I felt similarly about my experience with the national team, like hearing eventually in the, my last couple of years playing that I was like supposed to be like not new anymore. I kept, I was still like, no, no, no. Like you guys don't get it. Like I'm still just like scrapping to get called in, <laughs> but I really had to kind of try and establish myself as a leader and like step up and fill that role. And I think that I wish that I recognized I was in the prime of my career when I was in it. And so I know you didn't ask me for advice, but I think seeing yourself as a veteran now will help you with that mm. and, and accept like understanding and realizing that like this, you can have such a huge impact on a younger player now. And I just wish I had like known that when I had the mm. chance to, does that make sense? No, it definitely does. I totally get what you're saying. Cause sometimes I'm yeah. like, why do, why would people look up to me? I'm just like newbie. But like I'm not. Yeah, you go. You got. I know. You got to own it. Um, yeah. Okay, we're gonna pivot a little bit. This is gonna be um, more about mental health. So you are somebody who's always been outspoken about issues that are important to you. It seems, and so I want to talk to you about a moment that happened um, at the beginning of your second professional season in 2020. It was during the pandemic. Obviously, this was an insane time for so many people around the world. But we in the NBCL went to Utah and we played in the Challenge Cup, which was a bubble tournament during the summer of 2020. It was a very crazy time. And during the tournament, you posted on social media that you had a panic attack during a game. And I'm just going to quote you. You said, I was having difficulty breathing today in our game and knew something was wrong early on. Following being subbed out, I fell to the ground and had a panic attack and was unable to catch my breath and seems to be anxiety related. Can you talk us through this moment that we're referring to and like what it felt like as it was happening? Yeah, I think as with many people, just COVID, the bubble, I never dealt with any mental health before then. Um, I didn't really know what anxiety was. I, I always just thought like if I couldn't catch my breath, it was because I was tired. Um, I wasn't in shape or like the conditions, it was too hot. Um, and yeah, in this moment, like I remember warming up being like, I, I can't breathe. <laughs> like, I don't know if it's the Utah mountains. I don't know what it is, but like, whatever, I gotta, I'm starting, I gotta go out there. Um, and I just remember like 10 minutes in, I was like, I can't keep going. Um, and when you start thinking about it, it kind of makes it worse and makes your heart race that much faster. And that's what it did for me. And so I was like, I need to come out. And by the time like I got, stepped off the sideline and got to the bench like I just fell over and it was really scary because I didn't know what was happening because we never had language for it we never talked about it like it, it was so taboo and so I think that's what made me even more afraid thus furthering like my hyperventilating and everything and when I went in the back room I just remember laying down and thinking like I just don't want to be here anymore I don't want to be feeling this anymore and that again, it's like just a scary thing to like say out loud or like put in your head. Um, I just like wanted it to go away because I didn't know what was going on. Um, so yeah, that was like the first instance where I like had panic attack, anxiety attack on the field. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, who helped you like come up with the words for it? Like who helped you identify that it was a panic attack? Yeah, I so that night I, I will never forget like our our owner at the time and I think someone on staff like I had a meeting with a counselor like the next day and I was like what like I, I really didn't really know much about counselors or therapists um, you, you always think like they're for people who have like psychotic issues not just like simple things at least that's what it was at that time I think and so I was able to get in touch with a therapist and like she knew what I was talking about because she deals with that day in and day out. And wow. so she was able to help give me those words um, and help me understand what I was going through and why I was probably going through it under these like intense circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like you decided to share this moment on social media and I feel like in general, a lot of athletes and people like put out a very not vulnerable version of themselves onto social media. Like posts are perfect and very buttoned up and, you kind of hide your anything that might be perceived as like vulnerable or even negative. And so I think one of the things that makes you 
so special and unique as an athlete is the ability that you have to connect with your followers through vulnerability instead of perfection and like perceived like my whole life is perfect and we're connecting more with you because you're honest. So when you decided to post about it, what was that experience like deciding to share this really vulnerable moment? And what was the response like from people who read your post? Yeah, I don't even think I realized like how vulnerable I was being. I thought I was just being like informative. Mm. Like people were confused why I came off like in the first half. And so, and I got people texting me. So I was like, I just want to let everybody know, okay. Um, but this is what happened. And it wasn't until I saw the responses that I was like, whoa, like this is a space that has like not been stepped into. It's not talked about. People were like so appreciative. And I'm like, I feel like I didn't do much. And that's when I realized like, wow, this is something that needs to be talked about. Um, and people need to be vulnerable about it because so many athletes are dealing with it, especially now. And so I think that's kind of what made me realize like, oh, I need to keep talking about this, keep posting about it because it's clearly connecting with people. And that's like what I want to do as like a human being is just to share my honest experience. Yeah. Do you feel like the whole experience, so having it happen and then reaching out to people and having them respond so well, was that helpful or like transformative in any way? Uh, clearly it's made you have this um, <laughs> like new outlook, like you're get, studying counseling now. Um, can you just talk a little bit more about how that felt to like connect with your audience? Yeah, it, it obviously felt good. And I'm, I was happy that simply me sharing it impacted people. It was such a small thing, but the fact that it had this profound impact like makes you want to keep talking about it and keep having these discussions. And yeah, it's led me to this moment where now I'm getting my degree in counseling because of something that happened to me because I just feel like there's a need and I want to help fill it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's cool that I have this platform that I can use to talk about those things. And I feel like in that moment, it helped me realize like what I can do with this platform that I have um, and how I can impact people who are experiencing the same thing as me. Yeah, I think in a lot of ways you've like kind of changed, helped change the narrative, especially in our circle around this. I think that obviously this is totally different, but I just wanted to share when I was dealing, I was injured with my knee for years for like a really long time. And I think throughout a lot of it, I felt like I couldn't share about what I was going through and dealing with it and how serious it was because I felt so protective over like my space and like, really like how sad I was. I didn't want to share that with anybody. But then when I did, when I had to retire, it was received with so much love that I wished I had shared it sooner. Mm -hmm. And I think that somebody like you who went through something really difficult and shared it and got that response, I think you're like paving the way for other athletes to do the same. So I wanted to try to just like commend you on that and, and share a little bit of my own story. Um, and I'm curious how you handle your mental health now. Like, do you have different strategies for playing elite sports and dealing with anxiety? Do you work with anybody? Yeah, so I have my own therapist, but then our club also offers a sports psych, and I use her a lot too, just for more soccer-specific things. Um, she's been a great resource, um, and she does, like, collective team stuff as well, but then can meet with each of us individually. Um, so she gives me a lot of like tangible things to do, which I really like. I'm very much like a tangible, like, what can I do? X, Y, Z, probably type A yeah. <laughs> of like yep. things I can do. <laughs> um, so she's been super helpful. I just like, I start to figure out what I need, what my needs are, um, how I can use what the therapist has given me. Um, uh, cause it's kind of just like learning, like you try things, it might not work and you just learn like what self care looks like for you and what mental wellness looks like for you. And you apply those things and just kind of carry them with you. Yeah. I've worked with the sports psych uh, for like the last three years of my career. And then obviously all into my injury, I needed it the most. But, um, I remember, especially when I was playing at man city, I was like journaling every single day after training. And it was a habit that so tangibly helped me on the field, like play better and then respond to my performance better, good or bad. And I, that was a really tangible thing for me um, that I learned from my sports like that had such a huge impact on my yeah. career. Is there anything you're doing that's tangible that you could share with us? Um, similar to that, I do love journaling. Um, yeah. I'm not really big on it right now, but like I have like four or five journals from like my rookie year of just me, like writing out all my thoughts, <laughs> so everything. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool to like look back on and be like, wow, this was like 
a moment or a mark in the sand type of thing. Um, but right now I'm like really trying to redefine how I define success. And so, um, like, especially when I'm like going back and looking through film, um, our sports psych is like, well, you didn't score this game, but that doesn't mean you had a bad game. So like watch the game and tell me like what you did good. That means like you're successful because for me as a forward, it's so easy to be like, if I didn't score, I had a bad game or like, like it, it, it's just, that's the way it always feels. And so like, no, like how was my hold up play? Like, did I connect my passes? Like there's so many other things that define my success. And so, um, that's something I do now when I'm watching film is like, okay, well, what did I do good here? That makes me successful. That makes sense. That's really cool. Um, so as we've said, uh, your path to the pros was really unique, but it had so many incredible moments, including in November of 2021, when you got your first cap for the U S women's national team, it was in a friendly against Australia that the U S won three to nothing. And so as somebody who's spoken out about being like doubted and criticized along the way, and as somebody who's taken kind of a different path than a lot of our colleagues, what did you feel in that moment, stepping onto the field for the national team, playing at the highest level possible, representing your country? What did that feel like? I think I crapped my pants. I was so, <laughs> it's just like, I, I think I, like I, maybe everybody who has their first cap feels this way of just like, you can't even process it because it's just like, what, what the heck's going on? Like, oh, coach is telling me to go in for the US of A, like what? And so I always like, once I got to the pros and like was doing well, I just thought that that was it. I didn't really think of anything beyond that. And now all of a sudden here, I'm like getting called to like represent my country. Like uh, who on earth would have thought about this? I mean, you always like reflect back to like that younger self, like no way in heck was I thinking of that. And so it was like such an incredible honor. Um, I know like my family and parents were just so proud of me. And so to just, I don't know, have that moment is, is absolutely incredible. And I'm so glad that I was able to do that and hopefully I can do it again one day. Um, but yeah, kind of just like a, like a moment where I'm like, wow, I, I was made for this. I am capable. I can belong on this stage. And like how, what can I do to make sure that I keep getting back there, I guess. Yeah, for sure. I think like the national team environment is also like so intense and in my, this is going to sound like a joke, but like, I'm literally not kidding in my experience. It felt like you couldn't show any, even like a perceived sign of weakness. So mm -hmm. like, everybody's going to think I'm crazy, but I wouldn't even like wear my eyeglasses down to the meal because I didn't want the coaches to think that I had weak eyes. Like, I'm not joking. I was like, nobody can know that you have glasses. Like you have to put out this <sighs> strength all the time. But so my question is like, in all seriousness, do you feel like there is like any stigma around being open about your mental health in a professional sports environment that people will see you and go, maybe she can't handle the pressure. Do you, do you ever think about that? The stigma around that? Oh, a hundred percent. And I think I still like tell myself that sometimes like, Oh, you can't do it. Or like, Oh, this is, you're too stressed right now. And so I think one telling myself that that's not true, but also like letting everybody else know that, um, you can like have this mental health, but like still be successful and still perform. Um, it's just knowing how to work with it. It's not something that debilitates you. It's just something that you're, you're dealing with. I think it's like a both and like, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Um, and I'm really big on reminding people that like mental health, like should never be an excuse. Cause it's, it's always something you can work with and reframe your mind. It just takes practice. I think a lot of people, they experience something really hard or really traumatic and then they're just like I'm out which that can be the choice for some people but I think like there's you find so much about yourself when you like dig in and work with it um, and that doesn't mean that you have to like show up and be 100% every day like I don't have that like there's mental health days I want to take it's just like knowing it's just knowing so much about yourself having self-awareness um, because I think people are a lot stronger than they give themselves credit for. And so well, thank you so much for sharing all of that. That was like incredible. And I'm like so honored that you were so open about that. Um, and you're open in transition. You're open in so many ways. You're very open on social media. Um, and you'll like advocate for women in sports in general on social media platforms where trolling and misogyny are like always present, but you'll like actively fight back and call out comments like this. And I'm so curious what calls you to engage in this way. Like, why do you think it's important? 
Yeah, uh, it's a it's a balance for sure. There's so many people I want to respond to. My teammates are like, Beth, like, don't pick that fight. And I'm like, just <laughs> once, like, I need to let them know. And I think part of it is just people are so uneducated. So they're just making assumptions about like a general thing. And it just really bothers me that they like don't understand how exciting women's sports are, how it's growing. And it's just, yeah, these men who are sitting behind screens mostly who don't appreciate it and they might they might never will but like I still want to educate other people because I want the correct narrative to be put out there and so I'm if people say something that's wrong I'm definitely going to correct them because truth truth wins every time <laughs> somebody somebody's got to do it um oh, yeah. okay so before we let you go we asked for some questions for you from our listeners and we were inundated with requests for you to, can you guess, release the tweets from your draft folder. Oh my goodness. Um, you've made such a name for yourself by teasing the juicy, juicy tweets that are hidden away. Do you have any draft tweet that you can share? Uh, no. That's why, they're, <laughs> that's why they're in the drafts, everybody. That's why they're in the drafts. There was, after one game, I was just so mad at so many things and I, I just texted them to one of my teammates and then I was like, just screen record this so I can have it because I can't tweet it. So I just, I just need it. But like, I, I know it's like a healthy balance of like, okay, Twitter is not my therapist. Like I don't need to be using it, but um, yeah, unfortunately, I don't know if there's any that I can share, but they're, but they're all about bettering situations. They just might not be said they're in positive. the best way. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of like that exercise where you like write an angry letter and then you just throw yeah. it away. Rip it up. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. It's super healthy. Um, okay, last couple little fun questions we have for you. Best goal you've ever scored and can you describe it in as much detail as possible? Hmm. Um, yes, my rookie year, we were playing against Portland at home uh, in Tacoma, Cheney, uh -huh. great field. Um, and we were on the cusp of, um, playoffs. We needed to win that game to, to make it through. And I had like a pulled groin or something. So I was like, on, not even expecting to go in. We were up one zero. I get put in and I end up scoring a goal in like the 80th minute to kind of like ice the cake. And so it was cool because one, it was against Portland, as you know. We yep. hate each other. Love so that. <laughs> that made it really special. And then I, like just clinching playoffs, like my rookie year, super, super cool. I think like the further you get into your pro career, you realize like how amazing it is if you can make playoffs because of just how competitive the league is. And I don't think I realized mm -hmm. that in the moment, but now looking back, I'm like, whoa, like that was crazy. At that time, there were only four playoff spots. So um, yeah. yeah, just that whole moment was awesome. And I remember like running over to my coach and just, it was it was really cool because it was it was being like streamed on ESPN. I felt so cool. I was like, oh, this game is, is getting so cool. all it, of like the hype. Was it a header? No, it was it was a foot goal. Surprisingly, a foot goal. Um, yeah, a left foot goal. <laughs> um, a little near post. Near. I I actually physically remember the ball had kind of gotten like swung out as like a second second ball type of situation. I remember looking at the girl on my team, my defender, and saying, like, please don't pass me the ball. And she ended up passing it to me. And I was like, oh, crap, now I got to do something cool. And I ended up, like, cutting my defender and shooting at near post and scoring. But, yeah, it was crazy. Um, best player you've ever played with? I was, okay, Ugh. obviously Pino. <laughs> like, obviously, like, my rookie year, I like, I remember she was injured a lot. And I just remember going to the locker room at halftime, and she was just, like, chirping my ear off, like, talking to me, coaching me. So, like, that was really cool to have, like, her mentorship. <laughs> But then, like, also I think of, like, playing with, like, Eugenie Le Sommer. Like, what? Like, so I, cool. I still, her highlights come up on, like, my TikTok every once in a while. And I'm like, I played with her. Like, that's crazy. Well, that's uh, amazing. There's just been so much talent that's come through the rain and the other teams that I've been on. So, yeah, it's hard to pick. If you could be on any TV show, like, I don't know if you watch reality TV or if you have a favorite show, would you ever want to be on a TV show? Yes. I would be on Survivor. <laughs> oh, I love that one. I want to be on do Survivor. You, do I you think don't, you would do good? I don't know. I think, like, I'd be really good at the challenges. I think I'd be so bad at strategy because I would always think that someone's <laughs> trying to vote me off. I would, I'm, I'd be so paranoid. Like, I Maybe would just be so there. afraid of being blindsided. 
trust no one. <laughs> yeah, every man for yeah. himself. But I think it'd be a yes. crazy experience. Oh, survivors are a really good answer. I like that. Um, okay, Bethany, this was boats. Forgive me. This was such a this was such a joy having you on. I really have been a fan of yours for such a long time. You're so much fun to watch play. You're so dangerous in front of goal. And I love that you've given yourself permission to be open and honest with your followers. It's very refreshing. And I think a lot of athletes really struggle with that. I'm very excited to watch you this season with Seattle. Um, and I'm really happy that we're friends now and I can call you both. <laughs> and I just wanted to leave you with one final question. Um, do you have a message for anybody who may be listening to this that is struggling with their mental health? Mm. Obviously, don't be afraid to ask for help. That's the first step, and it's also the hardest, but it opens up you and your mind to healing, um, to growth, and I just think there is so much power when you take something that's trying to weigh you down and turn it into something that you can use to your advantage, but also connect with other people because I think it's just so important to know that you're not alone and your struggle is also someone else's struggle. You just need to share it in order to know that. That was amazing. Thank you so much <laughs> for sharing that. And thank you so much for being here. It was so fun to talk to you. Yes, thanks for having me. Oh my goodness. I feel like me and Betty are just besties now. I really love everything that Bethany had to say, especially about mental health and about how we are capable of handling more than we think we are. I can't believe she's getting her degree in counseling while she's playing professional soccer. What an incredible human being. And I feel seriously so lucky and grateful that we have all these wonderful people coming on the show and sharing their stories with us. I'm also really looking forward to the Gold Cup final on Sunday. Just a reminder, that's USA versus Brazil. And I am heading out to San Diego to be there. I'll be posting tons of pregame, in-game, and post-game coverage on our TWG social channels. So make sure you are following us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. All of that is at Women's Game MIB. You can also subscribe to our newsletter that will come into your inbox every Monday by going to the link tree in our social media bios. There is also a big, big, beautiful announcement about the Women's Game coming tomorrow on Friday. When I say big announcement, I mean like my life is changing. Your life is changing. I'm not even being dramatic. This is a huge deal. So please follow along so that you don't miss anything. Next week is going to be a big one and you really don't want to miss anything that we have going on here at TWG. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm Sam Mewis. This is the women's game and we'll see you soon.